Hello, my friends. Um, today, it's my distinct pleasure, honor, privilege to be speaking uh, to Dr. Robert Waldinger. Um, he has written this book along with an associate, Mark Schultz, and it's called The Good Life, Lessons from the World's Longest Scientific Study of Happiness. Now, the book just came out and it's getting amazing reviews. Um, everywhere I go, uh, people are talking about this book, both in academia and elsewhere. And of course, uh, I personally have been an admirer of Dr. Waldinger for a long time. Before I ask him to say a few words, just to introduce him, uh, Dr. Waldinger, Robert Waldinger, is Professor of Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. He's director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development and director of the program in psychodynamic therapy at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's a practicing psychiatrist and he's also a Zen master, Rashi, who teaches meditation in the US and internationally. This book actually summarizes, I believe, 84 years of research, longitudinal study on, um, um, I believe now 84 years of research with 84% compliance in the participation and about four generations of people. And so I don't think there's any book that has more authority than this one on what makes the good life. So first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Dr. Robert uh, Waldinger for joining me. It's a great privilege. Thank you. So, oh, it's a pleasure to be here. So let's start with, you know, I mean, the fundamental finding of this book is that uh, uh, the only thing that really matters, the one thing that matters in creating a life of, let's say, contentment, meaning, purpose, happiness, um, decreased suffering, <laughs> the one thing that stands out, um, given all the other variables, is um, meaningful relationships whether they're with your significant other, with your family, with your children, with your parents, with your friends, with your professional colleagues, or with the divine. Um, that's the bottom line, right? That is the bottom line. And when we first began to find this in our data, we didn't believe it because in some ways it stands to reason that we would be happier, more content if we have better relationships. But how could it be that better relationships would make it less likely that we would get coronary artery disease, you know, or type two diabetes? And so we thought, how, how could this finding be real? And then, as you know, many other studies began to find the same thing. And then we began to have great confidence that this is a very powerful, real effect. So Dr. Waldinger, yes, you mentioned many other people have found the same uh, results as you have, but this is the longest and most uh, detailed study ever. Uh, it has looked at four generations of people. You've been involved in the study for many years. Before that, it was George Valiant and who I also admired very much. Um, Tell us a little bit about the study itself, the protocols used. In the beginning, it was all Harvard students, mostly white males, and then also indigent uh, students from Boston, uh, but also white males mostly. But as, as the generations evolved, it started to include other people. Tell me a little bit about the protocol, how it began, when did you get involved, why did you get involved? Why do you think this study is important? And what, what we can all learn from the findings of this book? Well, the studies began as two studies that did not know about each other. So one started at the Harvard University Student Health Service with undergraduate sophomores, 19 years old, who were thought by their deans to be 
fine, upstanding young men. And it was meant to be a study of thriving, of, um, of normal adolescent to young adult development. Now, of course, we would never imagine that you would only study white males from Harvard as a study of normal development. But at that time, that's what they did. And then, as you said, the other study was begun at Harvard Law School, and it was begun as a study of juvenile delinquency, and particularly how some of these boys from Boston's poorest families and their most troubled families, how those boys stayed on good developmental paths and didn't get into trouble. So both studies were about thriving, but one in a very privileged group and one in a very underprivileged group. And then since then, we've brought in spouses and children, more than half of whom are women. So we have gender balance now in the way we didn't when it began. So you have these two disparate groups, one privileged and the other not so privileged, in fact, uh, not privileged at all. Um, to start with, the studies are young white males as the study evolves, includes women and of course, offspring. What was the difference between these two cohorts, in your opinion, if any? The, the most stark difference was that the Harvard men lived on average 10 years longer than the inner city men. And that undoubtedly had to do with access to health care, with lifestyle issues, that people who were more educated took better care of their health. And as you know well, that taking care of your health has an enormous impact on how well you age and how long you live. And so what we found was that the, the inner city men died younger. What was not different was their levels of happiness, their levels of contentment in life. So the privilege of the Harvard men's lives did not make them happier on average than the less advantaged group. So, you know, right now, as we look even at uh, some of the outcomes from COVID-19 and general, you know, mortality as we grow older, um, from chronic illness, from mental uh, illness as well, um, it seems to correlate uh, from what I've read um, with the zip code, which basically uh, tells you everything about a person's socioeconomic environment, uh, also whether there's crime rate is high or not, education levels, salary. So socioeconomic uh, conditions certainly develop, uh, certainly influence what you're saying, both health span and lifespan, but not necessarily the degree of contentment or peace or happiness or joy, um, you're saying that, right? Yes, and in fact, they've now quantified this. There was a famous study, I think that Daniel Kahneman did in 2017, where they looked at how much your happiness increases as your income increases. And they found that once your basic material needs are met, and they estimated it was about $75,000 a year annual income in the US. But once your basic needs are met, the more money you make, you don't get much of an increase in happiness at all. And that seems really important because the culture keeps sending us these messages that getting rich will make us happier. And that turns out not to be true. It's a tricky thing. You know, you draw talk in this book about stages of life and, you know, different institutions, different wisdom traditions, but also religions. There are stages of life. You know, we begin life as a baby and then you're a toddler and a teenager and then a young adult, mature yeah. adult, and then you get to my stage and you start thinking about dusty death all the way to dusty death. I do, yes. So, you know, in, in my tradition, um, four ashrams of four stages, and, uh, you know, the first, to put it in simpler terms, first 25 years um, is all about education, uh, been there, done that. In the second 25 years, 
you take care of your family, you achieve some degree of fame and fortune. So I can say, been there, done that. The third 25 years is devoted to, in some way or another, finding meaning, purpose, giving back. And then the fourth, which I entered, you're not there yet, sir. But um, <laughs> the fourth, which I entered, I became, I was 75 last year. You're supposed to figure out what it was all about. What was, you know, this is the time for self-realization, preparing for death, etc. Now, I can say very comfortably that uh, at the age of 75, I feel contented. I feel at peace. I feel uh, joyful. I feel that I have a meaningful life. I feel I've contributed. But there's an element always of discontent, you know, that, uh, that life never seems to feel complete. And, you know, you might say, um, what do I need now in order to feel this completeness that we call contentment or or, you know, finally figure it out. And now, you know, I can comfortably face the next chapter, whatever it is. I find myself a little bewildered and confused at my uh, stage in life. So how exactly, you know, would you, um, would you make a distinction between pleasure? You talk about, you know, uh, various kinds of happiness, uh, hedonic, uh, you uh, you know, uh, the happiness that comes from pleasure, which is transient, but there's another happiness that comes from meaning and purpose. And But is there ever such a thing as total contentment? I'm just asking you, since you've devoted your life to talking to people as a psychiatrist. I love this question. And actually, I would like to ask you the same thing, Deepak, but let me tell you at least some thoughts that, that keep roaming around in my mind, um, that my Zen practice teaches me that we never fully arrive, that there is no final place to be, except of course, the final place for us all is death, but, but that life is never complete and life is never completely equanimous, that there are always these ups and downs. And, and one of the things we deliberately did in the book was to choose the stories that reflected this so that we don't give the impression that if you just do all the right things, you will finally be content forever. That that's just not the truth of life as I've known it for, for anybody, either you know, in the thousands of research lives that I've studied, in the patients who I work with every day in psychotherapy, or just knowing my own heart and mind as I sit on a meditation cushion every day, that each of those windows tells me that there is no final contentment, that it's always moving in and out of, um, of joy and frustration and concern and, um, and equanimity. But I'd love, to, I'd love to hear your perspective on this. Well, you know, my perspective has evolved in the sense that, uh, as you know, I'm a student of not only uh, Buddhism and Kashmir Shaivism and Vedanta and um, some of the um, deeper teachings uh, that come from the Zen traditions as well. And I was close to, uh, at one time, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh and right now, to His Holiness, uh, Dalai Lama. And, you know, the more you read this book, and I've been thinking about this, the reason we are not contented is we ask this question, what makes me happy, without asking the question, who is asking the question? Mm. You know, because when I ask this question, what makes Deepak happy, then I can't find an entity that I can actually hone into that that's Deepak. And that what we call Deepak is this web of relationship that you talk about. And in fact, the more I ask myself questions about Deepak, 
the more concerned I get because first of all, I can't find this person, Deepak. Which one? The toddler, the baby, the, the fertilized egg, the zygote, the embryo, as I said, all the way to dusty death. I can't find a single entity that I can say that's Deepak. And the more I look at the web of relationships, that too is evolving over a lifetime. You know, I don't have the same kind of relationships that I had as a teenager or the same emotions. So the question then becomes, and uh, the more I've reflected on this is, we're only unhappy when we think about something that actually doesn't exist. <laughs> As we've been told with all these wisdom traditions, the separate self is a socially induced hallucination. So, and this hallucination is the one that's making us unhappy. The, 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 the unhappiness is based on a false identity in a way. And all the time that I feel unhappy is when I'm thinking about this guy who is actually um, in the matrix of relationship is all there is. That has been exactly my experience, that the more I'm focused on this thing I call Bob, the more I suffer. And the more I allow myself to, to know the truth of my interconnectedness and that everything is always changing, that I'm always changing, that, that this web of relationships and the world is always changing, the more I know that and really appreciate it, the less I suffer. Um, but what I find is that I can't always stay in that place. Sometimes I get consumed by the drama of Bob, right? And then I can gradually move out of it, particularly as I practice with it, as I meditate, as I contemplate this fiction, um, but that I'm never completely free of it, that I'm always moving in and out of this, um, this fiction of Bob that makes me suffer. But I loved your description. I think your description captures exactly my experience of this phenomenon. So Bob, is this then peculiarly human, this whole question of identity? This, you know, is a peculiarly human question and being peculiarly human, it is really the ultimate uh, cause of what we might call the existential human suffering because ultimately, Everything that we call a person is going to grow old, have infirmity, and and there's death, the final chapter. So, you know, I think in these traditions also, there is such a thing, and in all these spiritual traditions, uh, such as, you know, the dark night of the soul, when you suddenly uh, get this uh, anxiety about your uh, personal identity, and, you know, it's, it's in every religious and spiritual tradition. And then uh, we're also told if you kind of cross the abyss uh, into what we call transcendence, that there is something called innate joy uh, that comes from uh, a shift in this identity of self from not only me to we, but ultimately the one awareness in which we are all kind of part of a collective dream. Exactly. And there is actually a, a writer named David Loy who, who speaks about this. He talks about the idea that many of the practices that make us suffer the most as human species are these practices of trying to shore up the self, this futile endeavor of trying to amass wealth, of trying to amass power. So his idea is that much of the destruction of the earth, that many of the wars are very much about trying to shore up a self that doesn't truly exist as an independent entity. And that, that the, the way of practice is moving toward this awareness that you're talking about, of this interconnectedness, this oneness, that then makes many of these preoccupations with wealth and fame and achievement and power makes them fall away because they are ultimately meaningless. And so this 
experience that we call empathy and compassion and joy and equanimity and even the loss of the fear of death ultimately can only come if we shift to this deeper identity of interbeingness. Yes, absolutely. And I think that there's a way to notice it in ourselves. What I notice is that when I have that, a glimpse of that, of just what you're describing, my stress is reduced. My preoccupations kind of evaporate. And so I can see in the moment that my suffering decreases when I cultivate this awareness that you're talking about. And so it's not some great abstract thing that we have to arrive at. We can test it out moment to moment. I'm speaking with Dr. Robert Waldinger. The book is called The Good Life, Lessons from the World's Longest Scientific Study of Happiness. And um, it's about how do we create a more meaningful and satisfying life I have uh, done a quick read of the whole book and then I started my second read. But for those of you who are contemplating what you'd expect if you buy this book, which I think you should, um, here are some of the chapter headings. What makes a good life? Why relationships matter? Relationships on the winding road of life. Social fitness, keeping your relationships in good shape. Attention to relationships, your best investment. Facing the music, adapting to challenges in your relationships. The person besides you, how intimate relationships shape our lives. Family matters, the good life at work, investing in connections. All friends have benefits. And the conclusion, it's never too late to be happy. So that, that, that conclusion is very significant because a lot of people do wonder, you know, um, you know, I've had this kind of life of discontentment, unhappiness, maybe anger, resentments, grievances. Uh, is it too late to shift? And um, I think we now have enough evidence from neuroplasticity and epigenetics is that actually relationship in that direction of empathy and compassion and joy and equanimity actually changes the neural landscape of our brains. You know, even though our brains are created by genes, they are sculpted by experience. And all experience is relationship. All experience is relationship. Yes. And actually, we've been collaborating with an epigeneticist who helps us look at how genes get turned on and off depending on our levels of stress. And then different proteins get synthesized and different genes express themselves in the body. And so what we're seeing is literally how this plays out in the ways our, our bodies and minds can be restructured based on our levels of stress. Um, and, and thank you for pointing out the, the never too late part of our book because what we found in studying all these lives is that people who were sure that they were never going to find love, that they were never going to find friendship, then were surprised at times and in places they did not expect. And, and so we, we put those stories in the book. They're true stories of real people. I saw them. Yeah, because, because it seems so important that if, if, you're if you think you are sure what's going to happen in your future, think again. We can promise you, you don't know. And that's, a, that's good news for most of us. Yeah, in fact, we don't know anything except the past. Everything that we know has already happened. The only thing that is real is the unknown anyway. Um, so I'm speaking to Dr. Waldinger. Uh, as I mentioned, the book is called The Good Life, uh, Lessons from the World's Sci Longest Scientific Study of Happiness. I had a couple of more questions here, uh, Bob. You mentioned uh, the set point in the brain and the the happiness equation from uh, Sonia Liebermersky. Uh, you know, and I've been kind of quoting that her work as well. The happiness is equal to set point plus conditions of living plus, uh, you know, the last part, which is uh, do you seek happiness through pleasure or through meaning and purpose? Um, so from what you're saying and from her work as well, uh, talk a little bit about the set point. We can change the set point too, right? 
the set point they say is harder to change that we ex we think that um, there are powerful genetic influences you know some of us are more cheerful we are pollyannas and some of us are more gloomy and and you know i have two sons and they came out of the womb different temperamentally and they've stayed different all the way into their adulthood and i think we all know people who who have what we think of as the happiness set point that you described and that's what sonia lubomirsky is talking about but she estimates that's only about half of our happiness the other half is a, a bit about life circumstance, but a great deal under our control. And so her estimate is about 40% of our well being is under our control. That's an enormous amount. You know, and, and your life's work has been dedicated to that 40%, I would think, right? In helping people to figure out what is possible in my life, what is possible in terms of taking care of my body and my soul and my mind. And I think what we're saying is yes. That, that we do have inborn influences on our happiness set point, but there's a great deal we can influence by what we do and how we live. In fact, there are studies now, I believe, on people who win the lottery and they make a lot of money, and in one year they're back to their set point, in five years they're even worse sometimes. Yeah. Because it makes them mean spirited and money becomes their identity. They confuse self esteem with self and self worth with net worth. I mean, it's quite true, isn't it, that money can actually maybe alleviate um, uh, some of the suffering and bring you comfort in life, but it certainly uh, doesn't necessarily buy you happiness. No, and, and as you're suggesting, Beyond a certain point, money can become a burden. Many wealthy people begin to think that they're not sure who their real friends are because they don't know who wants to be with them just because of their wealth and who really cares about them as human beings. And that, that becomes its own burden, just as fame can become its own burden. Who wants to associate with me because I'm well-known and, and who loves me just for me? And so what we really that, that what we really come back to is the truth that these relationships that are based on authentic mutual connection are the bedrock of what of what keeps us content and makes life feel worthwhile. And hedonic pleasure or hedonic happiness is temporary, but there's something called fulfillment, which comes from meaning and purpose and relationship which is more permanent yes and and hedonic pleasure is good right you know we you know i love a good meal i love being with my family and having an hour of wonderful conversation and so that moment to moment pleasure is is not to be avoided and not to be neglected but what we find is that this longer term sense of meaning and purpose is what sustains us and particularly what sustains us through the hard times. So, you know, many of our original research participants were born during the depression and they served in World War II and saw horrific combat. And when we asked them, what got you through these hard times? Everybody to a person talked about their relationships. And so what we find is that that longer term sense of life being worthwhile, even during the hard times, comes from our connections with other people. My very special guest today has been Dr. Robert Waldinger. The book is called The Good Life, Lessons from the World's Longest Scientific Study of Happiness. I just read you some of the chapters, and I suggest that uh, you go through this book very carefully, because even relationships, the way you have actually outlined the, the map of relationship and how it changes as we grow older. These relationships have different qualities when we are younger in our adolescent years, in our younger years. Relationship always also evolves, hopefully, and it's not so impetuous and 
you know, not so self-serving as it is when we are younger. And, and therefore, I think this is a very important book. You know, in the tradition of yoga, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, you know, there are the first two principles of yoga are called yama and niyama. So the yama, so are the five rules or principles of social engagement. And they're called yamas. And the first one is peace presence. The second is uh, speaking your truth. The third is uh, abundance consciousness or generosity of spirit. The fourth is absence of clinging and grasping. And, and the fifth is, um, you know, um, sexual responsibility. These are the rules of social engagement. Then there are rules of personal interaction with your own self, which are, you know, mental and physical hygiene, contentment, which comes through relationship, a certain amount of discipline, but also study of the self, your physical body, observing your mental and emotional framework. And ultimately, you know, despite everything, the great rishis and the yogis that I have studied, they say, do everything. But in the end, you probably still have to surrender to mystery. There's no explanation for what, why this whole thing is. What does it all mean? You know, everything I now look at my past, it's over, but Bob, most of it is over. It's like a dream. It can shine, you know, our life is a dream. Once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we're dreaming. And then we wonder, where did it all go by? I mean, 76 years, fortunately, still going strong. But what's left other than surrender to mystery? Because um, it's, it's bewildering. The very fact that we exist and that we have awareness that we exist is a kind of a very bewildering state, which is both a state of grace, but also a state of turmoil. At least I feel that. Right. But you know, the other thing that I think is, is wonderful about this point in my life is being able to connect with someone like you who also um, understands the mystery and understands how little we end up knowing about this great mystery of life. And that there's a certain pleasure and contentment in sharing with another person who's had a long life journey in sharing this and, and recognizing it in another person. I mean, this is, this is for me one of the great pleasures of this conversation, actually. It is for me, too. And I thank you very much. And it also convinces me, by the way, you know, we, we are both physicians. We are both students of biology. Um, both understands, understand that the brain is a very important organ that helps us experience. But, you know, as the more I think about at my stage, about our fascination with the human brain as a physical object, the more I realize that there's no way a physical object that can't even feel its own pain, you put a knife through it and there's no experience. How does this physical object come up with all these conundrums about existence and who am I and what do I want and what's and you know I I'm now convinced after all these years that um, you know the brain is an instrument uh, that we use but it couldn't possibly be the source of experience it, it is an experience in itself you know the brain is another perceptual activity in human consciousness. And that to me is reassuring that the one who's bewildered, the one who's asking these questions, um, the one who's seeking the good life cannot be a physical object. Cannot be found, right. Cannot and, be found. And consciousness can't be reduced to neurochemicals and neuroanatomy. The consciousness is a, is a miraculous mystery. You know, Tagore, the great Indian poet, he said, he said two or three things that uh, that have lived with me since I was a kid, um, because I grew up 
with his poetry. He said, the fact that I exist is a perpetual surprise. Yes. And he yes. said, if you're not surprised by your existence, your humanity is incomplete. That's one thing he said. Yes. And the other thing he said, which has lived with me all my life, is in this playhouse of infinite forms, I caught sight of the formless. And that's what blessed my life. So I think we can agree on both these things. Life is a mystery. And existence is formless and infinite, even though it appears like all this, you know. Absolutely. And I, let me add one quote from Emily Dickinson, the poet. She said, to live is so startling, there's hardly time for anything else. Well, let's conclude with that beautiful thing, because it resonates with Rumi, who said, uh, exchange your cleverness for bewilderment. <laughs> my very special guest has been dr robert waldinger please pick up the good life lessons from the world's longest scientific study of happiness i assure you you will be happier once you read this book thank you thank you bob thank you so much for having thank me thank you thank pleasure. you